In this video, we'll set up a minimal API in .NET 7 the right way. We'll configure endpoint filters, the new .NET 7 edition, but make sure you stick till the end so I can show you how you can make the most out of your route handler filters. So let's get coding. The first step is to create a new ASP.NET Core Web API project in .NET 7. I'll call mine market MGR give it a path, place the solution in the same project. We've got .NET 7 preview. I will link down in the description all the uh, versions that I'm using, the SDK, the runtime, and the uh, version of the Visual Studio that I'm using. Disable open API support and uncheck use controllers because we're going to be using minimal APIs. Okay, so let's go in program.cs and let's clean up the default endpoints that we've got here so that everything is uh, nice and clean. We've got three dependencies to install. So if I click on dependencies, manage new get packages, go to browse. And because we're using .NET 7, we need to use the same version of the Microsoft packages as the major version of the .NET. So everything uh, will need to be version 7. So in the case of Entity Framework Core SQL Server, we're going to install the pre-release 7.0.0 preview 4.2. The same with Entity Framework Core Tools. We'll use this to generate and uh, update, they generate migrations and update the database. Last but not least, we will be using Fluent Validation. The latest stable one at the time of recording this video is 11.0.3. We will be using a SQL Server database. So we'll go ahead at the root of our project and create a new folder called Data Access. In here, we'll manually create two other folders. One to hold the data context. Let's just call this data and want to hold the entities, called entities. There will be another one called migrations, but that will be created by EF Core tools when we'll generate the migration. Now let's create our application a database context. So in the data folder, click add new class, and let's call this class market MGR DB context. This will inherit from DB context and will import EF Core. This will be a very simple database context class. It will have a constructor that initializes the DB context options of type market manager DB context, which is uh, our current class. And we're grabbing the base options as well. And then we're defining the uh, product DB set or table. So let's create this product entity right now. We go into entities, add new class, and obviously this is going to be called product. And because this is a market manager, a product entity will hold data that is useful for the managers of a supermarket. So things like ID, the name, the price, the weight, if the item is in stock or not. So a very simple class. Now, if we go back into market manager DB context, we'll be able to import the data access dot entities. One other thing that I would like to do is to go inside properties and then launch settings.json and change the ports to 5001 for um, the application URL for the HTTPS 5001 and for HTTP to 5000 and so that we know what URLs we're working with when we're debugging. Uh, then I'm just going to take the nullable property out from the market mgr.c sharp project file. Next, let's go to app settings.json and in here we're going to uh, define the connection string to our database that doesn't yet exist but we'll actually initialize it with our migrations. So we're creating a new property called connection string, open and close curly braces and then inside of it we define the default uh, connection. This server is localhost. The database is called or will be called market MGRDB. Trusted connection equals the true. Trust server certificate should be defined as true, but only on dev environments. Make sure that you don't do this on a production environment. Make sure that you actually install a proper SSL certificate. Save this file and we go to program.cs and right below where the builder has been initialized, we add in builder.services.addDB context. And in here, this is going to be of type market MGRDB context, which is our application database context type. And we define the option of use SQL Server. And inside of use SQL Server, we pass in the connection strings and let's import the usings dot data and entity framework core. Now we can actually add the migration. So create the initial migration. This will be stored inside the data access. So if you expand package manager console and in here, this line will actually be uh, appended in the description, so make sure that you check that out. We've got add-migration, we'll call it initial create, so this is the name of the migration, and the context is market manager context. The output directory will be data access slash migrations. As you can see, a migrations 
directory has been created with an initial migration and the market uh, manager DB context model snapshot. We go back in the package manager console and we type in update database and we give it the name of our migration, which is initial create. If you expand the SQL Server Object Explorer and you go on your local host and expand the databases, you will notice that we've got our market MGR DB created with a couple of tables, which will be our table that we've created and the EF migrations history. So the products with the columns that we needed. If this is helpful so far, why not hit that like button so that this video can spread to as many wonderful human beings as possible, just like yourself. I would really appreciate it. Now, because we've got the database in place, what we can do now is actually create the endpoints, the route handler. Inside our application, create a new folder called endpoints. And in here, let's create a separate class for our product. And we'll call it obviously product endpoints. This will be an extension class, therefore, we'll add in the static modifier on it, as well as on the method that we're going to create right now. So this will be a public static void called map product endpoints. This will obviously take in the web application. And here we'll get to uh, actually call the methods that uh, we haven't yet created. So things like uh, app map get and uh, map post, map put. But first, we need to actually create them. Let's create a method that actually uh, returns a full list of products that we've got in the database. This will be a public static async. The return type will be a task of I result and we'll call it list. It will take in a market MGR DB context because it will work straight with the DB context. Then we define a result by um, awaiting on the to list async applied to the products entity. And then we return all those results in an OK message. Let's actually import the data access and the F core. Then next, let's have a method that actually returns just a single entity from the database based on the ID passed in. So this again will be a public static async with a return type of I result. This will be called get. Again, we'll take in the market manager DB context and the ID of the item that we want to retrieve. We're finding the product from the database by its ID. If it is of type product, then we return that product to an OK message. If it's not, then we return results not found. And we need to add using for the data access dot entities. Then let's have a method to actually create uh, a product. This will take in a market manager DB context and a product entity. And all we're doing is we're accessing the products entity and we're calling the add and passing in the product. And then we're saving the changes asynchronously. And then we're returning results.created and we're passing in the URI as product slash and then the ID of the product, as well as the uh, product that's uh, newly being created so that it contains the newly created ID as well. And then we'll have an update method. This will be called update and take in a product entity, again, a product object called updated product. So the first thing that we're doing is we're finding the product by the updated products ID. And if we don't find it, we return results not found. But if we do, so if we get to this stage, we're actually finding it, we've actually found it. We update the name, the price, the weight, and um, of whether it's in stock or not. We save the changes asynchronously and we return results.no content. Or you could just as well return the updated product. Let's create the delete method and uh, it will take in the DB context as well as just the ID of the item that we want deleted. If we do find the product, meaning if the product that we have found by the ID is of type product, so if it's a value product, remove that product because we've just found it and save the changes asynchronously. Return that to uh, to an OK results message. Otherwise, return 404 not found. And that's it with laying out our methods. Now let's map them to the uh, web application. The first one is map get. This is going to take in the route, which is slash product and the method as a delegate. So we're calling the list method right here. The next one is get following by create, which is a map post. Then we have a map put and we're passing in the update delegate. Last but not least is the delete by calling the map delete. Now all we need to do to register all of these endpoints is to go in program.cs and after uh, builder.build to do app.map product endpoints. And obviously it's not going to know about it because it's an extension method, but if we uh, import market manager dot endpoints, we will be able to register those endpoints. Okay, I just wanted to quickly let you know that I post regular tutorials just like this one. So if you do enjoy this, then hit the subscribe button and join the club. 
Okay, so I know for a fact that we're going to be working with validation in here because we're going to make use of the filters feature enabled in .NET 7. So we have already installed Fluent Validation in our application. So all we need to do is let's add the actual validation class. If we create a new folder called validators, and in here, let's create a new class called product validator. This is going to inherit from an abstract validator of type product. So let's uh, import the fluent validation as well as our data access dot entities create a um, constructor in here. Let's create some simple rules for our product entity. So the first one uh, will add to the name and uh, we want to make sure that the name is not null, not empty and the minimum length is three. Then the price and the price we want to make sure that it's not null, not empty and uh, not zero because nothing is free in this world other than uh, love and friendship. Same with the weight as well as this is in stock. Uh, we want to make sure that it's not null. So that's it with the fluent validator class. For this to take effect inside our application, we need to go to program.cs and actually register this here. So we go right above the uh, add db context and we do builder.services.addscoped. And the first part is the I validator of type product. And uh, the second type is the actual class name of type uh, product validator that we've just created. So let's import the namespaces, product and the product validator. Let's run the application and let's see what we've got so far. If I go in Postman, we want to actually create a new item. So I'll add in an avocado with a price of weight and um, whether or not it's in stock. We clicked send, we've got that returned back with a status of 201 created. If we get all the products, which is just a get request to the slash products, then we'll actually see the newly created avocado. Let's quickly update that. It's not ripe anymore and uh, it's just gone down in price. Send 204 no content. And then if we get all products, we'll notice that it updated. The get product works in the same way, but passes in, in a, an ID. So we've got it here. And then if we decide to actually remove that by sending a request to slash products slash one, the ID of the newly created product, we'll actually delete that avocado. So getting all the products will return us an empty array. Okay, so this works now, but we want to make sure that the data inserted in our database is actually quality. So to do this, we'll make use of the filters feature enabled for us in .NET 7. So in here, where we define the create method, we actually need to pass in another parameter here. That's the actual validator. Let's import this in. This is the fluent validation parameter. We don't need to pass that in through the um, API call. These will be automatically passed in by the middleware. Same with the updates. Okay, so the validation errors can be uh, multiple at a time. Therefore, let's create an extension method that will actually combine them together so they can be shown in a nice way. So let's create a new folder called extensions. In here, let's create a class called validation error extensions. Again, this is going to be static. All we're doing here is we're creating an extension method called get errors that takes in a list of fluent validation failure errors. For each error, append the error message to the string right here and then return the messages as one string. So let's chain the dot add filter extension method. And this allows you to pass in a delegate, a delegate that exposes the route handler invocation context as well as the route handler filter delegate, two important arguments that we're going to be using inside our delegate function that we're creating on the spot. So we know that the validator is the second item in the list of uh, arguments that we're passing in. We know that the product entity that we want to create is passed in as the third one. So this is how we define these two variables by going into context.parameters and then we access the third parameter and then the second one for the, for the validator. And then what we're doing here is we're validating the entity that we've passed in by doing validator.validate async. And this is going to apply the rules to ensure that data is correct and it's storing the result in the result variable. If this is invalid, obviously it's going to have errors and we're calling the get errors extension method that we've created and we're storing that in a variable and we return a results.problem. Otherwise, return next. One thing that I forgot to do is to pass in the errors inside the uh, inside the problem object that's returned. So this will be an, um, a server error. You can also return bad request and whatnot. So let's import our extensions and let's go through this. So again, we're grabbing the validator, then we're grabbing the product and then we validate that. If the validation has failed, then return those errors 
back to the client otherwise hit next this next will actually invoke the delegate method the create so up until this point we haven't reached the create method yet if everything went fine in here then we're actually going to go ahead and call the create method and let's put this to the test now i've put a breakpoint uh, inside the filter as well as inside the create method so you can see that the create method doesn't actually get hit if the validation fails so if we try to create a product with an empty name then it'll get here we've got the validator that's of type product validator we've got the product successfully and the validation obviously failed and as you can see the create method hasn't actually been hit and this is the result name must not be empty the length of name must be at least three characters you entered zero characters so that's good so we know that we can't actually pass in invalid objects into our database finally this is fine the way it looks right now but it can get a little messy especially if you have more than i don't know two three four methods that each of them require their separate separate filters. So for instance, we'll need to do exactly the same thing for the update method. And we don't want to repeat that all that logic. Luckily in .NET 7, we can actually inherit from iRoute handler filter and we can create a more generic filter for our application. So let's do that right now and let's see how we can clean this up even further. Let's create a new folder called filters with a class inside of it called validation filter. This is going to take a generic type and this will be the entity. So in our case, the product. Or if we've got more entities that will require validation in the future, say stuff member, this will be defined by the stuff member class. And this will inherit from I route handler filter where T is a class. And let's actually implement this interface. So as you can see, it created the an invoke async method that's returning a value task. And this again exposes the route handler invocation context where we can grab the parameters from and the next method that we can use to actually carry on with the execution of the endpoint. In here, we can actually encapsulate all this logic from here. So if we cut this and paste it in here and we make a few modifications, obviously the I validator will need to be imported and the product entity will not need to be imported. So everywhere we use this product entity will replace this with the T because this will take the place of the entity that we need to uh, apply the validation on basically. The squiggly lines complain because this is not an asynchronous method yet and uh, let's import the extensions. So this is doing just the exact same thing as previously but we've encapsulated it in more generic class so we can use it very simply and much cleaner in a way that I can show you right now. In here we can remove all this. We only need to call add filter of type validation filter. This is the uh, new class that we've just uh, created. This is going to take the type of product and let's import the validation filter. And this is how we apply the same logic as we've done previously, but now we've encapsulated it to be generic. And all we're doing here is we're calling add filter. And we can apply this basically to the update method as well. And every single time we have something that we need to validate, we can do it this way. So long so it has a fluent validation logic in place, we can do it this way. But what happens if another developer comes in that doesn't know that the signature of the method needs to be like this and the order of the arguments is important? For starters, we can actually inject the validator instead of actually grabbing it from the parameters. So let's go up here. We do private read only I validator, and then we define the class level validator in here. And let's actually inject it in the constructor like this. So now we can get rid of this and we can use the class level validator like such. And because we have injected the validator inside the validation filter class, we can actually get rid of the validator from the argument. So we'll do this for the create as well as for the update. We don't need to pass that into anymore. And also this needs renaming as well to be item. And this is fine as well. But then what happens if they change the order? Like I said, we won't know for sure that the product or the entity that we want to run the validation on will sit on this index in our array of arguments. So to get around that, we can actually define a parameter argument right here. So we do var parameter equals to context parameters. So the same single or default. And we know that the parameter type, so this is how we can get the type, must be equal to the type of t. T being the entity. So what we're doing here is grabbing the only parameter from the list of parameter that has the type of, say in our case, product. So this represents the product entity. And we're using single or default instead of first or default because we want this to return an exception in case we've got more than one parameters that are of type T. And we can remove this. And just to be sure in here, we want to make sure that the parameter is not null because obviously single or default will return null if a validatable object hasn't been passed in and we return battery 
request saying the parameter is invalid. And we've got an error here because we need to actually cast this because at this point we actually know if the parameter is not null and we have found something then it means that this something is of type t. So we just cast that parameter to the validatable type. If you want to learn how to add authentication to a minimal API, then check out this video right here. Until next time, stay safe.